Good afternoon, folks. My name is Jimmy Bashar with the ISO Stakeholder Affairs Group. My pleasure to welcome you to the ISO Stakeholder Call to discuss the 2021 Draft Policy Initiatives Roadmap as part of our annual Policy Initiatives Roadmap process. As you may know, the ISO creates its annual policy initiative catalog that documents current, potential, and planned policy initiatives. And after recently finalizing this year's catalog, uh, and once more we thank those of you who submitted input for that, um, as well as we thank those of you who are uh, participating today uh, despite current events, and that you're staying safe and healthy. Um, the ISO uh, then extracts its three-year roadmap from its final catalog the first uh, year of which we refer to as our annual plan that solidifies the proposed initiatives that the ISO will undergo for the following year. Um, and as mentioned, it's called, uh, of course, discuss the first draft of uh, next year's roadmap. Um, in addition, uh, calls and webinars are recorded for stakeholder convenience, allowing those who are unable to attend to listen to recordings after the meetings. The recordings uh, will be publicly available on the ISO webpage for a limited time following the meeting. And of course, the recordings and any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. Uh, and lastly, of course, if you have any questions, uh, you can raise your hand virtually by pressing pound two. And we uh, please request that you state your name and the company that you represent. Uh, and without uh, further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, James, our first presenter. Uh, and we're also joined by uh, Greg Cook, Brad Cooper, uh, Lauren Carr, Gil Powers, Carl Meeson, uh, and Don Trethway, all from our market and infrastructure policy group. With that, I'll uh, hand it over to James. Thanks, Jimmy. Move on to the next slide, please. So I'll kick us off to discuss uh, our primary drivers of uh, this year's uh, three-year roadmap. Uh, so first, we know that our resource fleet is rapidly changing, uh, both in response to climate policy and also other market drivers like the falling costs of renewables and storage. And hence, we are transitioning away from natural gas as a fuel source for power generation. Um, however, integrating higher and higher levels of renewables will require changes to how our system is managed. And so, uh, First, we need to be able to integrate new technologies such as energy storage and demand response to replace some of the operational attributes that were previously provided by our thermal fleet, such as flexible capacity and other grid services, to make sure we ensure system and local reliability. Um, we also need to en enhance our market products, modeling and deliverability to make sure our markets are robust enough to accommodate these changes. The second primary driver is to both enhance the day ahead market and extend the day ahead market to EIM entities to leverage regional diversity and provide benefits across the West. Enhancements to our day ahead market will help address the growing uncertainty and variability of net load on our system caused by increasing levels of renewables we also think we can leverage the success of the Western EIM um, and the success it's had in reducing costs, reducing renewable curtailments, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by extending our day ahead market to EIM entities as well. Finally, our last primary driver is to align resource adequacy rules with these changing operational needs and tightening Western supply conditions. Uh, given these conditions, our RA program must be reformed to ensure we can meet our net peak demand and energy needs at all times with the RA fleet. Uh, so we are committed to working with the CPUC and other partners to explore reforms needed to our resource adequacy rules and requirements and processes to ensure the future reliability and operability of our grid. So with that, I'll pause to take questions on any of the primary drivers. You may dial pound two to enter the question queue. There are currently no questions. Okay. 
I'll pass the baton to Brad Cooper, who will go over the evolving ISO markets. Okay. Okay, thanks, James. I'll, I'll try not to drop that baton. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the first uh, major project that we're uh, currently working on and, and we're going to continue working on next year is our uh, Dead Market Enhancements Initiative, which has been uh, driven by the, the challenges of the transforming grid and, and also it's an important uh, precursor to uh, the next initiative I'll talk about, uh, extending the EIM to the, the Dead Market. Uh, as I'm sure most people know, is that the Day Ahead Market Enhancements Initiative is looking to uh, uh, more efficiently schedule supply, so it only not only meets our uh, our load, but also addresses the, the uncertainty that may materialize between the the Day Ahead and the real time markets, uh, which is becoming or has become and continues to become more so more uncertain because of, of the increased uh, variable energy uh, renewable resources we have on the on the system. Uh, this, this initiative, uh, in, in this initiative, we're striving for a market design that uh, co-optimizes these, these new capacity products to uh, meet this uncertainty uh, with the energy and with ancillary services so they're efficiently uh, priced. And the goal of this is to uh, is to get the capacity and get it without the need for out of market actions that we're that, that the ISO currently has to do to uh, make sure it meets the operational needs. The out of market actions include things like exceptional dispatches and the day and time framing time frame or, or uh, uh, what we call biasing load or increasing the load forecast in the unit commitment process in the real-time market to get extra capacity. Next slide, please. Uh, the other major initiative we're currently working on is extending the day and, and we'll continue to work on next year, is extending the day ahead market to uh, EIM entities. Uh, we think that's going to provide a uh, a lot of uh, regional benefits. Uh, it'll it'll uh, optimize day ahead unit commitment. Uh, it'll produce hourly schedules. And the important thing about these hourly schedules is that they'll reflect uh, economic transactions between a broader range of participants in the West than and more efficiently than currently can be done in the uh, in the bilateral day ahead scheduling in transaction processes outside of the ISO. It will also improve uh, transmission uh, use across a, a larger uh, footprint, and, and this will all provide uh, uh, increased market efficiency and, and help to more effectively integrate renewable resources. Next slide, please. We're, we're staging the EI, EDM policy development so we can uh, focus on the major topics uh, as, a, as a group before we go on to other issues and, and examine these issues in groups. You know, as the slide shows, there's a lot of topics to uh, tackle. Uh, this uh, bundle one is what we're currently looking at. Uh, next year, uh, we plan to take a bundle two and bundle three, uh, I won't read them off. Uh, uh, one one thing I would note about bundle three is uh, it, it addresses uh, price formation. And originally, uh, or in the recent past, we've been saying that we would address uh, scarcity pricing as part of this bundle three. And as you'll see later, we're now proposing that as a separate initiative on the roadmap next year, uh, though there will be uh, other price formation topics to talk about as part of uh, EDAM. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another major initiative we'll be taking on next year is what we're calling uh, the Dispatch Enhancements Initiative. Uh, we're undertaking this in, 
initiative uh, to address the need to uh, be able to better manage the increased amount of variable energy resources on the grid. Uh, we're going to look at things like uh, uh, managing ramp rates to better control the system balance, for example, uh, when, when solar is uh, curtailed or, or comes back online after being – or increases output, I should say, after being curtailed. You know, right now it, it comes back at a very high ramp rate, which can cause issues. Uh, a, a lot of managing uh, renewable output comes to uh, curtailing them uh, to below what they would otherwise produce. And so we want to look at uh, enhancing our market incentives to uh, get better response to those curtailment instructions. And then along with the uh, uh, curtailment, uh, there's, there's also potentially concerns about what's called decremental market power or, you know, market power uh, to uh, buy back your output from, from uh, day ahead schedules. And related to that is, um, is a decremental exceptional uh, dispatch settlement provisions. And th this initiative would address these. And I imagine as we, uh, we put out the issue paper for this paper, we'll identify other topics to address under this initiative. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then prompted by uh, the conditions under uh, that, that occurred this summer, we're now planning a separate initiative that we're going to prioritize for next year that's going to uh, explore enhancements to our scarcity pricing provisions. Uh, uh, you know, recently FERC approved our 831 our FERC Order 831 compliance filing, which in some cases uh, raises the bid cap to $2,000, but it does that in relationship to fuel costs. And the events of last summer, a lot of times prices outside the ISO went above $1,000, and that, that, was, that was not not driven by fuel costs, but rather more by the scarcity conditions. And so, uh, we, we, that's really those events really drove home the the need to improve our market's pricing in those scarcity conditions. Uh, uh, we do we do have uh, existing uh, scarcity pricing provisions. Uh, the, the way energy and flexible ramping product work together. Uh, I should note when when we put in our flexible ramping improvements coming this fall. Uh, they, they do provide a scarcity premium uh, somewhat, and, and then we also have uh, existing ancillary service scarcity pricing provisions that don't always work as well as a scarcity pricing scheme could in the real-time market, and uh, we, we will look at all that in, in, in relation to other potential designs. Uh, and then as a slide notes, and as I alluded to, at least for the 831, this this topic is also related to how our system market power mitigation and our FERC Order 831 uh, proposals work, and so we'll consider those part of this initiative. And uh, next slide, please, unless this is the last one. Yeah, this is the last one, so we can take questions. Again, dial pound two to ask a question. We have one question in the queue. Hey, Brad, uh, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. Um, do you have a forecast at this point for when you think the scarcity pricing initiative will start or when we might um, expect to see a issue paper and kind of more detailed scoping on it? Um, yeah, well, we have that coming up in a few slides. I believe it is um, uh, fairly early in the year. Yeah, I'm looking ahead, so um, 
should be, it, 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 we should have something coming out uh, uh, pretty pretty near the, the first of the year. We, we haven't worked out the detailed uh, schedule yet, but that's our goal. Okay. Yeah, I think Q1 is kind of the, the starting for the bar there, but just wasn't sure if it was kind of, you know, high priority to get right on that beginning of the year, if it was going to be a little bit later into the spring. So I'll uh, stay tuned. Thanks. Sure. There are no further questions. Okay, hi everyone. This is um, Lauren Carr, uh, Infrastructure and Regulatory Policy Specialist at the CAISO. I am going to walk us through these next few slides, which go over um, the ISO's vision for enhancing the resource adequacy program. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. Forward planning and a robust RA program is critical to ensuring reliable resources are procured with the right operational attributes um, and are available to the CAISO in order to serve load reliably in all hours. Um, particularly as the grid involved, evolves, the RA framework um, should ensure that the shown RA fleet can meet all our operational needs, including peak, net, net peak, energy, operating reserves, and flexible ramping capability. Also, the RA counting rules should promote the procurement of the most dependable, reliable, and effective resources, and should also consider use and availability limitations, as well as historic forced outage rates to ensure that resources are accounted for in a way that we can um, reliably meet our operational needs with the RA fleet. It's also critical to assess the ability of the showed RA portfolio to serve load in all hours under um, various load and net load conditions during all hours of the year. And the CAISO is committed to enhancing the RA program in collaboration with the CPUC in order to ensure effective procurement of capacity to reliably operate the grid. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, please. The CAISO has proposed several reforms to the RA program um, within the RA Enhancements Initiative um, to drive greater dependability and operability of the RA fleet. Um, several of those proposals are outlined in this slide here, um, the first being the UCAP proposal um, in which RA resources would be accounted for um, up front by considering the forced outage impacts um, and incentivizing availability um, of RA resources um, such that their capacity values properly reflect um, their availability. We also are proposing modifications to the RA import rules to ensure RA imports are dedicated to serving the CAISO BA load and there's no um, speculative supply or double counting from um, the RA import fleet. We are also proposing to conduct a portfolio assessment that would ensure the shown RA fleet um, can meet our operational needs in all hours um, for each RA month. We are also performing a review of must offer obligations to ensure resources are offering into the market um, 8760 with minimal exceptions um, in order to meet their RA obligations. We're also proposing modifications to our flexible RA program to align with the products proposed in the day ahead market enhancements to ensure sufficient resources are secured to meet our uncertainty needs and ensure um, reliable operations given growing supply and demand variability. And then finally, our operationalizing storage proposal will introduce a new tool called the minimum charge requirement, which will ensure um, sufficient energy is stored to be available at the right place 
and the right time to meet our operational needs over the course of the day, um, particularly during um, the net load peak. Next slide, please. Okay, so enhancements to the resource adequacy program are needed to align procurement with operational needs. I went over several of um, the important changes that we um, are proposing to the resource adequacy program, and many of those elements um, have interdependencies and varying levels of um, work to implement those proposals. So we've outlined a two-phase implementation plan. Um, the first for implementation in 2021 for RA year 2022, and the second for implementation in 2022 for RA year 2023. Um, and the first phase items are uh, more of the severable, severable items um, that can go in independently, um, whereas the second phase is the more um, foundational items or interdependent um, elements. So in phase one, we have the RA import provisions, the planned outage process enhancements, local studies with availability limited, resources, CPM clarifications, and operationalizing storage. And then in phase two, we have um, the UCAP requirements and UCAP counting, the portfolio analysis, and the aspects of the proposal um, that are needed to align with the head market enhancements. And those are the must offer obligations and bid insertion modifications and the flexible resource adequacy proposal. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and open it up and see if we have any questions on what I just covered. There are currently no questions in the queue. Okay, um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Jill. Thank you, Lauren. Um, this is Jill Powers. I'm the Infrastructure and Regulatory Policy Manager, and I'm going to be going over one of the other drivers of our roadmap, um, integration of new technologies, in this uh, case, distributed energy resources and store energy storage resources. So firstly, we're going to take a look if, if uh, those of you are aware that we've had multiple energy storage and distributed energy resource initiatives. We are up to our um, fourth uh, initiative, and we're really going to do some focus um, of the implementation of many of the proposals that we've had um, throughout these initiatives, as well as um, do we have an opportunity to evaluate the proposals that have been implemented. And then um, to focus on doing some cleanup, cleanups in our, our BPMs, um, and to make sure that we've addressed everything and um, that we, and uh, to, to determine whether or not changes need to be done to those BPMs through our evaluation. So our focus is going to be on the continued implementation of ESDER 3B, which actually deployed um, this past week, um, as well as uh, the implementation of the ESDER 4 functionality uh, that was approved by the board uh, this past month, as well as the new um, functionality uh, that is in progress, the energy storage uh, DEB uh, uh, functionality that is um, still in, in, in progress and is planning to go to the board in December. And what we'll be doing is evaluating what we've implemented in terms of its usefulness and its effectiveness for these distributed energy resource functionalities and to identify anything that remains in terms of gaps or barriers um, from those functionalities. Uh, at that time, we can do some evaluation and determine if there's anything new that we need to start considering um, as to enhancements to the current functionality. Additionally, we're going to focus on operationalizing distributed energy resources. And these are really the resources um, 
not so much that we have uh, visibility to. So one of the areas of emphasis will be on gaining greater flexibility to these resources, um, enhancing the tools uh, that we have in order to um, effectively utilize and operationalize these type of resources, as well as looking at enhancing our forecasting needs um, and overall operationalization of energy storage beyond what we've done um, and, and continued evaluation of what we've done in our previous ESDER um, proposals and implementation. Next. So um, the other efforts that we are going to take uh, is to ensure that we are effectively using as well as valuing um, distributed energy resources. Really going to take this time to allow for other um, regulatory authorities to develop any additional policies that they need to develop that still stand in the way um, for the integration of distributed energy resources um, in terms of what has is already provided and available as market participation functionality, um, wholesale market participation functionality that have been in place. Um, and in fact, just as a reminder, we've had the DE upper provider provisions in place since 2016. We've had about um, eight distributed energy providers that have initially signed agreements to provide these type of resources and utilize that functionality. However, for a variety of reasons, we have yet to see participation at any level of DER aggregations using these DER provider participation models. And that's one reason why I'm kind of going to take a step back and allow for a greater uh, coordination with our local regulatory authorities in order to um, develop the means that these participation models could be utilized. Additionally, we're going to be working and coordinating with the CPUC and the CEC on demand response valuation, on the load management standards that are being developed or are um, initiating development of uh, through CEC uh, and CPUC uh, uh, proceedings. Um, also in resource adequacy rules and load modification rules. So we're going to keep an eye on that, coordinate more with them um, as to what's happening in, in those areas. And just want to also mention that in ESDER 4 initiative, the ISO advanced the discussion of using an effective load carrying capability methodology um, for the qualified capacity valuation for DR resources um, in order to consider its variable output uh, nature. And so this is one of the areas that we want to continue to coordinate with the CPUC on, um, particularly in the RA proceedings, um, to kind of advance further discussion on what, what we had already done within ESDER 4. And finally, as mentioned, we're going to be refining any of the applicable business practice manuals and even looking at tariff provisions um, and some of the areas that uh, we recognize may need to be further clarified um, as with regard to must offer obligation of these type of resources, any additional resource adequacy rules that come out from other, um, some of our other initiatives ensuring that this is clarified uh, for these type of resources within our business, business practice manual, as well as um, within our ESDER 4, we, we will be uh, implementing the default energy bid for, for energy storage. So we want to make sure that um, we're refining and evaluating and refining as we go along and as we're gaining, um, gaining operational um, understanding of how these are um, developing within the markets. And we can move on to the next item, which is uh, our hybrid resource evolution initiative, um, which will be to further development on the provisions and to consider enhancements to the um, 
hybrid initiatives and hybrid resource market participation. Um, as we all know, many hybrid resources are expected to come online in the next three years. Um, so we know um, and have been working um, on a hybrid initiative. We're currently completed a phase one and working on a phase two, which is in progress. Phase one um, was approved by the board in July, and we're going to have a December deployment of the proposal under that initiative. Phase two, two which is still in progress, um, is still being de uh, developed, and this is planned to go in front of the board in November with a fall deployment. So really, there is ongoing um, initiative, and so the resource evolution initiative, hybrid resource evolution initiative, is really going to take some additional review um, of how these hybrid resources are participating in the market um, with the, these um, implemented functionalities. Um, we're going to take a look, review um, development of new, new tools, enhancements, or revisions to what the policies that have been developed, um, as well as consider additional ones such as market power mitigation for these types of resources, what the resource adequacy must offer obligations might be for these resources, as well as doing more of a data-driven evaluation to take a look, of, look at, okay, what are the additional functionalities that might be necessary, but really determine those or, or identify those based on our own operational experience of them. And that is the final one that I have um, in terms of integration of these new technologies. I can take any questions that there might be. Again, dial pound two to ask a question. We have one question. Okay. Um, hi, Jill, this is uh, Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Kathleen. Hi, Jill. I had a question for you. Um, with FERC releasing its order 2222 on that DER rulemaking, um, I was wondering if that's impacting any of the planning on the policies over the next uh, couple quarters or half a year. Um, if there's any insight you could share with that, that would be helpful. It is not impacting any of the policies or initiatives um, that we're outlining here in the roadmap. It is something that we are reviewing to see if there's any um, additional um, things that need to be uh, changed in terms of complying to the FERC order um, 2222. However, um, we believe that most of it do fall within um, the DER providers provisions, um, tariff provisions that we currently have for DER aggregation um, participation. Um, so I guess, in, in terms of where we go with this, in terms of our initiatives road mapping and our policy road mapping, I think this gets back to what we talked about in working very collaboratively with our regulatory authorities within the state of California to further develop the policies that may be currently uh, barriers to the integration of these types of resources into the market. So uh, I think that's where our greatest emphasis will be. Okay, great. Thank Even you. with the fourth um, order 2222. Two, two, two. Yeah, I appreciate the insight into the impacts and timing. Thanks, Jill. Appreciate it. Yep. And there are no further questions. Okay, this is Greg Cook. I'm the Executive Director of Market Infrastructure Policy. I'll be going over how all you've just heard fits into our three-year roadmap as well as our annual plan. Uh, next slide, please. So hopefully many of you have seen this slide before, but this, trip, this really shows how the interdependencies between um, particularly the resource adequacy enhancements, the day-ahead market enhancements, 
as well as extending the day ahead market to EIM entities all fit together, which is a primary driver of our ultimate roadmap. You know, starting on the left side, you can see that the ISO's resource adequacy um, enhancements will help to ensure that the ISO can pass the, the extended day ahead market resource sufficiency test. And, you know, by doing that, we'll be establishing new flexible resource adequacy requirements to align with the new proposed imbalanced reserve product, as well as ensuring that we have sufficient resources to meet the ISO's operational needs throughout the year, so for all 87, 60 hours of the year. And that includes meeting the net load peaks, as well as any energy limitations that, that need to be addressed. And then when we move into the day ahead market uh, enhancements, so the day ahead market design is going to be foundational for extending the day ahead market to EIM entities. And this will ensure that we can efficiently schedule both energy and capacity over a broader regional footprint. And this will also be used to establish then the must offer obligations for those scheduled capacity resources into the real time market. And by doing so, this will set up the resources for the real time market needs, which will include uh, intra-hour flexibility needs as well as uncertainty between the day ahead and real-time markets. So next slide, please. So we did, uh, as part of our roadmap this year, took some initiatives out that were previously on last year's roadmap. Uh, I'll go through each of those. First one is system market power mitigation. Uh, we did in looking at this, this would be advancing. Right now, we're currently going through an initiative to establish system market power mitigation provisions for the real-time market, and we had uh, committed to also looking for extending that into the day-ahead market. But as we look forward, we, figure, we looked and found that that would be most efficiently done in conjunction with the extending the day-ahead market to EM entities design. So we'll be including that as part of that initiative. Um, next, we've also uh, removed the Congestion Revenue Rights Track 2 initiative. This initiative was included on our roadmap last year as a placeholder, and it was put there in, in the event that the modifications that we did at the end of 2018, the Track 1A and 1B enhancements that were designed to address the auction efficiency issues that we've been seeing, um, once we had it was put there to see if, if in the case that we found that those enhancements were not sufficiently addressing the issues, then we would look at further refinements to our CRR markets. However, the, the earlier indications that we have and some of the analysis that we've done uh, since those enhancements have been put in place have shown that they have had a significant effect on addressing that auction efficiency. So at this point, we don't feel that we need to where there's any, no longer need to reserve that time for the Track 2 initiative. However, we will be continuing to look at refinements and enhancements that might be warranted for, for the CRR markets going forward. Um, next, the commitment costs and default energy bid enhancements phase two. So this is our CC Devi phase two, which was primarily the market power mitigation provisions for um, for uh, commitment costs. Uh, you skip forward a slide on me, Jimmy. Still going back. Jimmy, if you can go back to the previous slide. Um, unfortunately, Jimmy's having a bit of a technical difficulty. He'll go back in. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, so Jimmy, I'll, I'll try and, oh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> he threw me off there. So we. We've uh, decided to put off the implementation of that, which was currently scheduled for next fall. And the, the re reason for that is first, since we're just implementing phase one this fall, we want to see how, how well those reforms work. And, and also, once we can uh, end up with the uh, ultimate designs for the, um, for the EDAM or Dane Dane designs, we want to make sure that those, that design would still be consistent with that policy development. And then finally, we have also um, removed the contingency modeling enhancements from the, which was slated for implementation next fall as well. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First, uh, NERC has um, 
retired their TOP7 requirements, and, and as a result of that, we initially anticipated that the uh, contingency modeling enhancements would apply to five constraints in our market. That is now, with the retirement of that requirement, would be down to only a single constraint. And that one constraint that it would apply to only exists at certain times of the year under certain outage conditions. So given all that, we, we think it's prudent at this time to hold off on that because of the fact that, one, it's going to be a very expensive implementation, and two, we're also concerned about some of the processing time that it may be taking up in the day ahead market. So we want to ensure that with the day ahead market enhancements that we have planned that we're able to accommodate those enhancements um, as well as the contingency modeling enhancements before putting this in place. So at this time, we're, we're now deferring this until after the implementation of the day ahead market enhancements. Okay, next slide, please. So this gets us to the three-year policy initiatives roadmap. Again, these are the, the major policy initiatives that we have planned. Um, so the blue diamonds on this chart depict the implementation dates, and then the yellow boxes indicate the policy development timelines. So a lot of these initiatives are continuing on from this year. Um, you know, we've already talked about many of them, including the day ahead market enhancements, as well as extending the day ahead market to the EM entities. Um, we've pushed off the storage as a transmission asset to, uh, which was originally planned for 2021, off to 2022. Um, we're also looking at starting our frequency response measures initiative next year. Again, this would be to establish a frequency response product to um, take the place of the transferred frequency response provisions that we're currently using to ensure that we're able to meet the, the ISO's frequency response obligations. Uh, dispatch enhancements will be a new initiative we're starting next year. Brad talked about that one, as well as the scarcity pricing. Both of those we plan on starting early next year and having the policy development completed so that we can have it implemented by the fall of 2022. Um, our enhancements, uh, we talked about that with the, the phased implementation of that with um, some of the enhancements going in in the fall of 2021 and the remainder going in the fall of 2022. Uh, we're also going to start the joint owned unit modeling uh, initiative next year. This would be uh, you know, enhancement that many stakeholders have asked for to where we have jointly owned units that would help to uh, establish how we can divvy up the resource adequacy obligations and credits as well as cost allocations to that initiative. Um, and then finally, we have the you know, hybrid evolution initiative that Jill talked about. and you know, also note that we're, you know, we're taking a bit of a pause on more energy storage and distributed energy resource enhancements outside of what we've talked about through the initiatives we have planned so that we can do more focus on the implementation of the policy that's already been established. Okay, and then next slide. So then, whoops. So then finally, here's the draft annual plan. Again, this shows the full slate of initiatives that we plan on taking on next year. There's 13 initiatives here. We talked about, I went through the, the orange, which are the more of the major initiatives, but we also have um, three other initiatives that will be um, starting this year and going into next year. That's the EIM base schedule submissions, uh, as well as the, the EIM governance review will be continuing on into next year. And we're also have started an initiative on non-participating scheduling, scheduling coordinator options for EIM entities as well that will be um, continuing into next year. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on either the three-year roadmap or the annual plan. We do have one question in the queue. Hi, Greg. Uh, this is Ken Deeper or other Dallas Power. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay. Great. Hey, uh, so I've got a few things that, uh, you know, I wanted to bring to your attention, to this group's attention. Um, as, as you may be 
So we're Ellis Power is, uh, you know, we've uh, owned and operated now a couple of large uh, battery storage projects in uh, in Kaiso. And uh, we have had experience with uh, our first project for over two and a half years and the second project, which is uh, 250 megawatts. Um, uh, with uh, now just barely a, a couple of months of operating experience. So there are a couple of things that uh, you have, uh, we have learned, uh, especially over the last couple of months that we we think need uh, to be brought to uh, uh, Kaiser's attention with respect to either including them in uh, any initiatives in 2021, um, I was, uh, you know, hoping that there would be another uh, round of Esther initiative or new enhancements to Esther that would start in 21. But looking at your three-year roadmap, it looks like uh, uh, that does not start until 2023. So I'm going to, you know, just make brief comments on these three or four items, and perhaps, uh, you know, there are other initiatives that uh, this uh, could be addressed in. Um, and again, you know, addressing these sooner rather than later would be uh, beneficial to uh, to the storage community in, in general. I mean, as you know, there are only a few hundred megawatts of storage projects right now, and in the next couple of years, uh, there will be uh, you know uh, thousands of additional megawatts, uh, including uh, a couple of projects that we are Ellis Power is working on, which will be coming online the next uh, year or two. So uh, the first one really is uh, MCR, the minimum charge requirement, which currently is being discussed as uh, under uh, resource adequacy enhancements. And um, so there are, there's a lot of stakeholder discussion, a lot of uh, comments uh, filed by stakeholders where it appears that there needs to be more discussion on this MCR product. And, uh, you know, either it continues as a resource adequacy enhancement you know, into 2021, uh, or perhaps a new initiative. I'll leave that up to Kaiso, but at least wanted to flag that we may not be fully vetted with the MCR proposal. Uh, may not be ready to be taken to the ISO board in December. Uh, you know, we have we and several other stakeholders have uh, filed comments with respect to uh, other market enhancements that Kaiso should uh, consider. And in the interim, treat MCR as an exceptional dispatch, but then there are some settlement uh, implications of that that need to be uh, carefully uh, discussed and vetted as well. Uh, and I'll provide all these comments in writing, Greg, so uh, you and the policy team can uh, take a look at those. Um, keeping on, you know, just uh, the second item on my list is uh, Generally, you know, we've seen exceptional dispatch has gone up quite a bit in the last couple of months, and that might have been driven due to extraordinary, you know, uh, heat wave and conditions that California and the other Western states have been seeing over the last month and a half. But but that raises an issue with respect to exceptional dispatch for storage resources, and uh, we ourselves have experienced uh, quite a bit of that in the last couple of months. And uh, we don't think uh, the settlement rules as they exist today are, uh, uh, you know, fully applicable to uh, you know, storage assets. Uh, there's a definitely a big piece uh, of opportunity cost that's missing from those, and uh, those, uh, you know, that discussion needs to take place um, again sooner than uh, an Esther starting in 2023. Um, there's. Uh, there's issues and concerns with the multi-segment optimization, and we've filed comments uh, on this in the past, and uh, we, again, you know, have some ideas, and uh, there's, there's certain segments of the, uh, the multi-segment optimization that we don't think fit really well for energy storage. Uh, could lead to some uh, infeasible dispatches and and um, dispatches which could at certain times be not in line with uh, the bits uh, provided by the resource owner. Uh, and then lastly is uh, generally just, you know, there have been several infeasible dispatches um, which, you know, have, uh, you know, sometimes could even lead to operators taking storage assets out of the market and uh, trying to achieve uh, the outcome uh, that uh, they're looking to achieve. So there are quite a few policy type issues that need to be addressed sooner than 2023, Esther. And again, I'm not saying 
they necessarily need to be addressed in that cert. Perhaps you know you could consider addressing them in uh, say uh, the dispatch enhancements uh, initiative. And MCR is already part of resource adequacy enhancements, but the remaining three maybe they could be addressed as part of the dispatch enhancements initiative. Uh, but the bottom line is I think we should try to address these issues sooner than later. Uh, or else there'll be thousands of megawatts of storage assets, uh, you know, facing similar uh, issues. Yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate those comments. And yeah, I do encourage you to include those in your written comments. Um, you know, that being said, for the minimum charge requirement, you know, that is still a live issue in the resource adequacy enhancements. We're, you know, still working on the policy development in that area. Um, we're also going to, you know, that will be part of the discussion at the Market Surveillance Committee meeting this Friday, so I encourage you to participate in that. And, you know, we still have some time on that one. We won't be taking the RA enhancements to the board until first quarter of, of next year. So, you know, there's still time for the policy development there. Um, related to the other issues you discussed, um, I agree, you know, we are, uh, we were planning on, addressing some of the storage issues in that dispatch enhancements initiative. So, you know, I think some of the things you mentioned there would fit well within the scope of that initiative. So, you know, again, include those in your comments and we'll, you know, look at those and see if they, how well they can fit into that initiative or whether we would need a separate initiative or something to that effect. But, but appreciate those comments. Yeah, we'll do right. Thank you. Okay. And we do have one other caller in the queue. Hi, Greg. This is uh, Kathleen Colbert again with Distra. How's it going? Hi, Kathleen. It's going well. Excellent. Um, I just have a clarifying question. Um, so for the RE enhancements, Lauren is talking through the two different phases and what felt within the scope. Could you clarify if for, for us if that's implementation being phased or if that's the, the remainder of the policy process that's going to be phased? Uh, that is implementation being phased. Awesome. Now, Thank Lauren, you so if you have any other additional thoughts on that, but yeah, that's primarily for the implementation. Yeah, Greg, this is Carl. Just to clarify, we still are on track for policy development completion sometime early next year. Yeah, for the entire okay, pack. Uh, thank you all for the clarification. Appreciate it. And there are no further questions. All right. With that, I'll hand it over to Jimmy to wrap it up with the uh, next steps. Thanks, Greg. And uh, thanks, folks, and to all the other presenters, of course, uh, and to all the questions and good input. As Greg said, uh, we do encourage you to put it in the written comments. Uh, thanks for your time, of course. This by current events, as mentioned, uh, this was recorded. You can look out for that in the next uh, three to five business days. Uh, and you can look out for the finalized roadmap uh, after we incorporate your input. We look forward to that. And uh, with that, have a great rest of your afternoon, folks.